Our first presenter this morning is Reverend Ruby Carter, who has plunged into, pun intended, into the issue of adult baptism in the Anglican Church and comparisons and discrepancies between theology and practice. So let's welcome Ruby. My interest in adult baptism stems from two challenges I had around baptism. Uh, the first was the concept of the open table, where Holy Communion is made available to everyone, whether they are baptized or not. And the second was while I was in clinical pastoral education as a student, I was asked if I would baptize a dead baby. Now these issues forced me to reflect on the meaning and significance of baptism, which led to these questions. Is there still a place for confirmation in the church today? What meaning does baptism hold for Christians now? Is baptism still sacred or of any significance at all? These questions could not be ignored and led me back to the basics of baptism. Historically, Christian baptism focused on adults. Children were baptized as part of the household. Over the centuries, thoughts changed. And during the medieval period, the practice of baptism in the Anglican Church included both children and adults, with adults being the majority. Later, the misconception of the eternal fate of those who died unbaptized and the high rate of infant and child mortality moved baptism to become, for infants, the majority. This is still reflected in our 1962 Anglican Book of Common Prayer, which is based on the prayer book from the 1600s. Here we find the service of holy baptism to children precedes holy baptism to such as are of riper years. Infant and child baptism appears to remain the norm in the Anglican Church, yet in our 1985 Book of Alternative Services, adults and children are presented for baptism before infants and younger children. Here it seems adults should be the norm. If so, then why do adults choose to receive the sacrament of baptism and what is their experience? What are adults looking for in a faith community today? Does baptism hold a good theological foundation for adults? What is their understanding of baptism? Are they looking for a new kind of experience of church and spirituality? Understanding their experience is important and will help the church to extend a meaningful and sacred relationship to them. After baptism, are adults continuing on in their faith journey or are they drifting away from or even rejecting the church? Without a, without a better understanding of their spiritual journey, the church could easily miss the opportunity to walk with them. The qualitative method of study I used included the phenomenological research method with a dusting of grounded theory thrown in for good measure. Here, the common lived experience of several individuals was studied. Data is collected and then analyzed by reducing the inf information to significant statements or quotes, which then are sorted into themes. Next, what participants experienced or how they experienced it is developed. The combination of these conveyed an overall essence of their experiences. Six participants were interviewed. All were baptized after the age of 19. Three from rural settings and three from urban settings. Three were male and three were female. They covered a wide range of economic, social, and educational backgrounds. So a snapshot of their personal history will help to bring a better understanding of why they were not baptized and the path that led them to seeking baptism. Family backgrounds range from quite functional loving homes to dysfunctional and even abusive conditions. Two knew as children that they were not wanted and never knew their fathers. Many moved around a lot. They said, initially it was very positive but changed after the death of my father and also financial struggles. Another said mine was difficult and conditions from the past created a negative view of the church. It was not there for us during this tragic time. 
It seemed the devil or evil was stronger than good, stronger than God. At age three, I was adopted into a very abusive home. I was not allowed to go to Sunday school, but could attend church. And another said I had a good childhood. None of the participants were raised in the Anglican tradition. As children, their faith experience were rooted in other Christian traditions. Many of my participants had one parent that either was agnostic or atheist. Two attended church on a regular basis, and one attended church sporadically. They named their mothers as the main influence. They were involved in Sunday school, choir, band, youth group, and Bible study. Three stated that they had no church life. Of their religious experiences, they said, after Sunday school, my grandfather would ask, what kind of lies did they tell you now? <laughs> I didn't believe in God. Well, maybe there was someone higher, but never gave it much thought. I believe there was much more than met the eye. We had family prayer and Bible stories every morning. Prayer and scripture were very important. My grandmother was Roman Catholic, and I was very aware of the tactileness of Roman Catholics, her rosary, candles, and crucifixes in every room. As children, these participants, or sorry, two participants experienced God in a unique way. One said, I know he walks with me because when I turned nine, I looked up at the stars and I believed in God. I found God then and was, very, and was never nourished. <laughs> the other said, I went to church camp when I was 11 or 12. My mother thought it was a riding camp, but it turned out to be a Pentecostal <laughs> church camp. <laughs> I get into the whole thing of accepting God into my heart. What stood out was sitting on a hill in quite long grasses by myself and knowing that God existed and that God had a relationship with me and loved me and felt my pain. This was an actual conversion. Children can develop their own religious lives and after camp, I had nowhere to go to church. Some told me that their parents chose to leave the decision up to them. Teen years brought changes. Many had turbulent teen years with one having an abusive mother and was seen as an outsider by the family and was left wondering, where is God when things go wrong? Another lived through an incredible hell because of father's substance abuse, which the family kept from the outside world. And yet another always held the hope that going to church would someday be part of their life. And in addition, another told me, change came when I was invited to go to church camp. As adults, this is what they had to say before finding and returning to the church. I had a good, stable family life. My father died when I was quite young. I've experienced a lot of tragedy in life. I was a political activist fighting for human rights. I traveled extensively, seeing many global tra tragedies. I had lots of emotional distress. I have no contact with my family. I met my, family, my real family later in life and chose not to be involved with them. They have different values. Only met my mother briefly. Regarding their faith, one had, some real, or had read scripture but didn't understand it. Another walked away from the church for 25 years because of all the do's and don'ts. It seemed more about rules and regulations. However, the journey back began with returning to church, attending Bible study, learning the Anglican way, and asking a lot of questions. Yet, still didn't feel worthy enough to receive communion, and at the time didn't realize that Anglicans cannot receive communion until they are baptized. One participant stopped going to church, except for Christmas, but stayed connected through reading about Christianity. However, most Christians had become the enemy based on a moral majority and some of the horrible things that were going on in the 80s. Another participant heard an audible voice, it's time to go back to church, but they didn't. They didn't want anything to do with it. They're nothing but hypocrites. Four months later, the voice was heard again. It's time to go to church. This time, they stopped dead and asked, where? And clear as a bell, Anglican. So they got dressed, went to the Anglican church, and as they walked in the door, experienced a feeling of being home. 
When asked what influenced or caused their decision to be baptized, many said their rector. They wanted a place to belong and so was baptized with their child. Some said they always wanted to be baptized. No one suggested it. Some wanted to walk the Lord deeper, wanted to live right, get back on track. One felt turmoil before baptism and life was chaotic. Also hearing about the church faith, Bible study and participating, it all seemed a natural progression. One participant was thinking about hearing in the wind the voice of God and started wondering and thought, it just might be. Some priests asked if they would like to be baptized and after saying yes, one of them said, I knew that I had given my heart to the Lord and made a commitment and things started changing in my life. One said, I was seeking a place for my children to learn about Christianity, God, and what it all means. I like the building, and a parishioner said, you should come down, it's a nice church. It's in my neighborhood, and I have connections with parish parishioners outside of it as well. First day at church, I indicated an interest in confirmation class and was invited to attend. I'm involved in the church community, Confirmation class was not a major influence in my decision to be baptized. It was something I wanted to do. And another said, I heard bells one morning, got up and went to church after many lapsed years. I wanted to be at the Lord's table. I could not be what God wanted me to be without baptism. It's hard to articulate. Baptism allowed the release of the Holy Spirit I had to die to my own self-reliance to allow something to happen. I asked them about their baptismal preparation. Everyone had met with their priests to go over the services. Some met privately with their priests, others met in classes for a few months. They did book studies, watched movies, read scripture, and asked a lot of questions. One received a Bible. Some said they were given a couple of books to read and things, but they didn't. These, this person panicked during prep and tried to back out of it, feeling it was a sham because of doubts about God. They believed in a higher power, but could do that without baptism. However, their rector said, people go to church for many reasons. One is to have a place of belonging. Each baptism was quite unique. As they took shape, four were in a church at the font, with one wishing that they had full immersion instead. Two were full immersion, one in a Baptist church with the bishop's permission, but before the Baptists would allow the use of the church, the elders conducted an interview, making sure that the inquirer understood baptism and its meaning. Otherwise, it would not be allowed. The other was in a lake. Use of the oil of chrism, all were marked as Christ's own forever with the sign of the cross. At the ages of 20, 38, late 40s, mid 50s, and early 60s, their baptisms were celebrated on the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday, Pentecost Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and Sundays in August and November. Baptism is a sign of new life through Jesus Christ, uniting the one baptized with Christ and his people. The scriptures of the New Testament and the liturgy of the church unfold the meaning of baptism in various images often based on Old Testament water symbols, which express the mystery of salvation. It's a participation in Christ's death and resurrection, a washing away of sin, a new birth, an enlightenment by Christ, a reclothing in Christ, a renewal by the Spirit, the experience of salvation from the flood, an exodus from bondage and a liberation into a new humanity in which barriers of division, whether of sex, race, or social status, are transcended. And when I asked, what did you experience in the actual baptism? One said there was no spiritual experience, and I felt a little bit embarrassed, very uncomfortable at the ceremony. People were watching, just going through the process like a heathen because I wanted a place to belong. However, I respected the service, it gave a sense that there was hope. Another felt saved, at peace, honored, sacred, a part of the church and accepted. Said it felt great when the oil was put on her head. One participant said, 
My little girl held my hand when I went up to be baptized. In her eye was a look of slight wonderment. It was profoundly moving of being moved to tears. Baptism is a rebirth, an emergence into the body of Christ. This person feels language as a struggle with all things to do with our Trinitarian God, a mystery really. At some point you have to state it as best you can, and that's what the baptismal process is. It's a beginning of a language to articulate your faith. This period is pretty joyful, really. Eventually it wears off and you miss those days, but you never forget. We have relationship in baptism through others, and it's a human touch that is conveying Christ and God. It's just a reminder of that relational God. As the hand touches the forehead, it's almost like an extension. In the words, you can feel quite comfortable in committing to loving others and giving kindness to others and renouncing Satan and evil. However, theologically, they understood evil, but not what Satan is. One felt called to priesthood, like the first blush of a romance and was frightened. Stating baptism is an irreversible before and after. You're baptized into the light. There's that death thing, but you're also being reborn. The physicality of the priest's hand, the human bringing another human into God's fold, equivalent to the washing of feet in intimacy. It's wonder, a bearing of self. The continuity with Christ and with every Christian for 2,000 years that has been baptized, being absorbed into something eternal was very spiritual and sacred. Communion after was amazing, kneeling at the rail, almost childlike, wondering about change, feeling fully brought into the faith, infused with the Holy Ghost, empowered through those promises to move as God wanted. Baptism and the Eucharist are inseparable. A fully immersed par par participant said, it had to be the most awesome thing, such a joy, a high that lasted days. When you're sent down three times, it's like being drowned, but when you come up, the feeling was gone, and each time you could feel the sins being washed away. Just can't put it into words. The other fully immersed participant said, it felt like there was no toll, no more worries, all had been lifted. A forgiving of sins, all sins that ever committed were just vanished. It's hard to explain. Just being dumped in water after being submerged of feeling lightened and closer to God. I asked them about follow-up after baptism. Of the priests, most felt supported, but not just because of baptism. Some now have social friendships with their priests. Priests are there for spiritual guidance, times of need and difficulties. They support and encourage my participants, often seeing things in them that they didn't. One said, I don't believe it's their job to support me. It may be my job to help support them. A priest should give opportunities to express whatever our gifts are, and I've been given that chance. One received a card from the rector on the first baptismal anniversary and found it very moving, saying, it comes back to that relational God. Another said, you don't have this if you don't belong to a church. Of their sponsors, one didn't understand what godparents were, and one set found it hum humorous and thought it would be great fun. Yet, and with another, they have a deeper friendship, and this godparent assumed that baptism would automatically mean participation in church groups and made them go without question. Yeah. <laughs> another had a family as sponsor, so there was great support. And for another, it seems to be waning after a year, and yet another had support. And another was just calling it a required church, a uh, requirement of the church, a formality. Of the church, one felt very supported even before baptism. Most said the people are friendly and nice, a place of community, belonging, and recognition. After baptism, a parishioner said, welcome to the best family you can possibly imagine. Many were encouraged to take part within the church. 
However, one said it's been sporadic and it seems they have to take the initiative all the time and there are times that that can be fatiguing. Of their family, they said most immediate families were very supportive and started attending church with them. For others, it didn't affect their family faith. One participant said, they believe I'm my own person and make my own choices in life. Just as long as I'm happy, they're okay with what I do. Very few extended family members were even invited to the baptisms or made aware of them. <coughs> Baptism is just not, not just about identity and belonging. It's also about being sent into mis- ministry and mission. When asked how baptism will affect their lives now, only one participant does not attend church Sunday worship, stating that the service is too long and that they don't understand it. All serve the church in many ways, such as through church committees, they support financially, Bible studies, teach Sunday school, youth groups, help with fundraisers, church camps, were wardens, lay readers, parish council members, choir and Eucharistic ministers. One said, when I served the wine, I was in awe of what I was doing and that that I had the privilege to do it. They help out where needed. Three participants are now confirmed. These three feel called to ministry and have academically furthered their theological education. A few remain uncertain about how to live out this new discipleship. One said, I may need it down the road for such times when I have losses but you really don't need church when you're happy. (laughs) Concerning their baptismal vows, one said, I try to live out my baptismal vows, but I don't think about them. They're embedded, and the Gospels are saturated with them. I'm guided by my prayer life, the scriptures, and by action. Christ's own life is a good model for us. And another said, my baptismal vows have changed my life not erasing the past, but rather building on it. It's an intensifying of being more what God wants me to be. And one stated, I tried to live out my baptismal vows. This is what I promised, and now I understand them more. It's the beginning. I thought it was going to be easy, but I fail, and I stumble, but I keep trying. They talked about belonging, not having any regrets, And one said, baptism changed my lifestyle. I'm a different person, more peaceful. Another said, in rural living, you spend more time with your neighbors and they go to church, so you do. They recognize the sacred, the salvation, the need to continue to learn and be nourished. One said, baptism is a beginning, an incredible, irreversible thing. Ontologically, your being being or existence you're changed. Back to this before and after. It's a mystery, not static. A few comments surprised me. I'm more aware of others' religious faiths. Had I taken more time to see what they do, I might have made a decision not to be baptized, Anglican. My church here is too ritualistic. I don't even own a Bible, and I don't know what sacrament means. Parents are not often that open and vulnerable to their children as one is when they're being baptized in front of them. You're not always doing what you need to do in relationship to your God in front of them. It's the same when you pray in front of your children. That builds relationships spiritually. Baptism sent ripples through some friends and colleagues. They wondered if it was due to a breakdown or that I needed a crutch or something to lean on. No one ever discussed it with me. They don't want to engage, no curiosity. At work, religion is kept private, contained. It's always suspicious. I've now gone further in my ministry and friends don't think I'm foolish, but there's no encouragement. They're not there to have conversations about my spiritual walk. My rector actually was wondering what I experienced He was baptized at an early age, so he doesn't know the feeling of being baptized. It's a really tough uphill climb to get folks that had their children baptized to be involved in church. They just don't want to talk to you. It's like, whoa, you got baptized? Are you not interested? I think the church should find a way to promote adult baptism and get back to it. 
Confirmation was nice, but it wasn't the spiritual experience compared to baptism. Adult baptism is a way to go, and it's more serious, a commitment that's not so with infants. There's no promises in infant baptism. No, I'm going to try and live a good life, try and go to church to love my neighbor. Seems once infants are baptized, they're out the door and you never see them again. It's just get them done. Being baptized as an adult was such a wonderful experience. I wonder if it's clouded my opinion of infant baptism. It seems parents of infants don't get it. I like the Eucharist, but I won't drink from the common cup for fear of the germs, and I hate that little wafer. I'm nervous about going up, but I have a warm feeling afterwards, and I'm happy to go to the rail most times, except when the older priest is there. He makes me feel like a sinner. <laughs> I had a sacred moment, only for a millisecond. I was holding the chalice, when it was as though the church had split apart and all the saints were there. I almost passed out. It was somewhat terrifying. I have a hard time with having to be baptized before receiving communion. It's the Lord's table, not the Anglican table, not the priest's table. I know people who are baptized that walk the Lord deeper, or sorry, I know people that are not baptized that walk the Lord deeper than some who are baptized. One participant said she was amazed that church survived for over 2,000 years, stating this proved that there is something stronger than the church, stronger than the minister, and stronger than the world, even the Bible itself. There is something in man, something strong, and people go to church just to add to that. Questions have been answered and new ones asked. Baptism is indeed a very holy sacrament, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. We are baptized one by one, but to be a Christian is to be part of a new creation. Christians are not just baptized individuals, they are a new humanity. Baptism is not be, should not be taken lightly. It is a process that discerns, teaches, and makes new disciples. All who receive this sacrament need to understand what it is and what it means. In faith, hope, and love, the church can bring them to a deeper, love-filled, lifelong relationship with God and this new humanity. This requires action from the priests, the whole church community, and the newly baptized. Our Lord said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Um, those powerful stories of people who came to faith and to church and to baptism later in life. And I sometimes think, maybe we should be offering writing lessons in the church, you know, on Sunday. <laughs> the sign of this. Church camp, new thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, let's get questions for Ruby. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what some of the uh, implications or applications of this study are, uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. I think for, for uh, many of my participants, the key thing is they feel that bap adult baptism should be the way to go rather than the infant baptism. Um, and not necessarily just out of this study, but having relationships and conversations with other clergy, it seems the way that people bring their children to be baptized and you don't see them again you know, and then trying to get them back into the Sunday school system or whatever, it just doesn't seem to be there. Yeah, just, the commitment doesn't seem to be there with the adults. So, but what really surprised me, and I don't know if this really pertains to what you're saying, I was expecting people to say, well, I want modern music, and I want, you know, get rid of the prayer books and do this and do that, and nobody said that at all. You know, they're quite happy with the way the Anglican Church is. So that kind of threw me a little bit. I was expecting that. Um, well, just if 
if I could push you a little bit more, um, what does this say then to a tradition like the Anglican tra tradition that practices uh, infant baptism and has a um, theology of infant baptism? And you know, what what yeah. do we do about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, not a personal reflection because for me, I feel both are are equally important. And actually, one of my participants said that you know they both are important. And I think for um, the Anglican Church, I, it would be really nice if we had a laid out method of instruction. I think uh, would bring more understanding, like the one person was just given some books, here read this, and uh, they didn't. And so there was no real one-on-one, -on -one, and that can happen, it's not supposed to, but it can. And others had months of educational experience, so if that could take place with the infant parental preparation as well, Mm -hmm. You know, it would be, for me anyway, I think it would be way better, and I think the church should really look at some kind of structure that way. Penny, and then. Do you think that, um, I know you can probably only speak from the Anglican tradition, but, uh, okay, so do you think that the Anglican church has a theology of baptism that, uh, priests and parishioners understand. Like I know from some of your other comments, you've been talking about uh, people were given candles and said, I don't know what to do with this after being baptized. So is baptism, is a theology of baptism being conveyed in a way yeah. that actually makes yeah. sense to both yeah. the priests and those who are being baptized? I will say for priests, absolutely. Every priest that's ordained has a really good grounded knowledge and understanding of baptism and the, theolog the theology behind it. <laughs> Where I think the break happens is how each individual priest chooses to pass that on and their training in that. And sadly, I mean, there are some that, that don't do the educational piece as well as it should be done. And so people slip through the cracks, not really understanding, well, what is this? You know, at, in our baptism, we, we light the candle and we hand it to them saying, receive the light of Christ. But it's almost like a wedding where the bride and groom really don't remember what took place. You know, uh -huh. do you remember what the priest said? No, I have no idea. So it's almost like that. And I think if they have that good foundation beforehand and also follow up, baptismal follow up is really important. So, so what would that education look like? Like, what would you like to see? Because in answering Ricky's question, you said, well, I think there should be more, but what would it look like? Yeah, um, I think that time commitment, uh, one of our Anglican priests here in, in uh, HRM, I guess is the correct term, um, actually has a six-week program that people are required to attend every class. And then I think she also has a certain amount of time that they, they have to come to church you know, as a family before she will baptize somebody. So there needs to be some, for me anyway, I'm, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I think that there should be some requirements. This is not just a jump in and, and leave. And, and, and it sort of reflects back on that dead baby issue. You know, baptism's about making disciples. So, you know, what's being gained by that baptizing a dead baby? What's being gained by baptizing somebody who doesn't understand baptism? You know, so that education piece, I think, is really, really important. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, along the lines of dead baby, um, um, for Catholics, uh, baptism is poorly understood by some as a uh, bad baby, you know, sort of original sin. And uh, I think that's a, a turn off for adult baptism, at least it used to be. Uh, yeah. My mother was baptized as an adult because she married my father who was Catholic. And I remember she was almost always ashamed of original sin. And when we ever talked or learned about it in school, it was just like, you know, like put that one aside, you know, that's just one of those pieces that doesn't fit. And when you know a little bit more about it, theologically, I mean, it's, you know, anything that can sort of support a person in becoming the best they can be is a wonderful thing. I mean, it adds to the richness of, of, of the process. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. 
Hmm. <laughs> I can't speak for any other tradition other than the Anglican Church, and even at that, I don't feel that I have even a right to do such a thing. Um, for myself, um, I don't believe that God would refuse any of us into glory because we weren't baptized, you know. So that's, and I mentioned that, you know, that infant baptism came about because of that fear of, of going to hell or going to purgatory or wherever if you died without being baptized. And I think, you know, for a lot, um, I shouldn't say for a lot, for some that, that there's still a twinge of that there, you know, and, and uh, I believe in a very loving God. It's not going to reject a child. <laughs> so for people that, you know, are trying to educate themselves about baptism and maybe they even come across the concept, you know, in, in other religions, if they're reading literature and they come across that concept, how would you, how would you deal with it? Would you just say, like, that's history and it's something we're not proud of and put it aside and yeah. end of story? Or, or is there some way to sort of, um, you know, sort of mine it and, and still find some richness in it? Or, I don't, no. I don't know if it's a useful concept, potentially. Yeah, if somebody, and I have been asked that question in preparation, baptismal preparation, and I have said exactly what I just said to you. You know, God is a loving God, and if any of us die, you know, without baptism, God's not going to read. God knows what's in our hearts, right? And you're sitting right next to the original, original sin original. man right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 David, would you like to give your lecture now, or <laughs> I've got, I'll come back. I, behind you, and then. Thanks, Ruby. That was a great presentation. Um, when I grew up, and I dare say when most of you grew up, um, the idea of the open table really didn't amount to much because just about everybody had been baptized. Um, so, for me, I find it kind of um, exciting that now there are all these adults who aren't baptized and when they do come to church whether with their children to be baptized or whatever that there's sort of a you know an opening there for the priests to talk with the with the families or with the adults or whatever and I'm wondering if the people that you interviewed how many of them um, were the one who initiated and went to the priest and said, I haven't been baptized, I'd like to be baptized. Like, I see a lot of the discussions about open table being about the rules and whether or not someone has or has not been baptized. And so it's like, I have to fill out this paper in order to do certain things in my life and in the church, this is what I have to do in order to receive communion or be a part of things. And it's sort of seen as matter of fact, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I've had this experience of God pulling on my life, I found myself in a church and I don't know what to do with that. So I'm just wondering who takes the, who has taken the initiative in this? Is the priest the one speaking to the person and saying, oh, you have to be baptized, this is the way we do it? Or is the person coming and saying as a result of what I've experienced, this is what I, you know, yeah. feel I need to do? Yeah. For of the six adults that I, I interviewed, only one was baptized because the priest made it so. Um, this person was actually visited in hospital, was not a member of the church, just somebody who was a member of the church recommended that the priest go visit them. And um, while the priest was there, um, it was made known that they weren't baptized. And the priest said, oh, well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> uh, but everyone else came because of their experience in faith and want it to be part of the church. Yeah. All right, thank you. Ruby, I'm, I'm just exploring a bit more um, the privileging of infant baptism over adult or adult over infant or neither. And I just want to make sure I've heard your um, interviewees right, that the ones who were baptized as adults, what I'm hearing is that they had such a great experience that they think that other people should have access to this great adult experience too. Yeah. Is that, is That's that fair? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, um, the speaking against infant baptism is out of uh, frustration that we baptize all these babies and we never see them again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To me, I'm seeing in both of those arguments a very kind of selfish um, orientation 
that um, because I had a great experience at adult baptism, you know, your whatever happened to you as a baby can't be nearly as good as what happened to me. And on the other side, I'm hearing this selfishness or perhaps this fear of failure. I, I'm, I'm not in either of those arguments hearing, uh, and this is not about you, it's about the people you've talked to. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and I would lump myself with one end of that, that I, I'm not hearing any of us going particularly deeply into um, the implications for life and the church for the sacramental life, which says that in the process of baptism, we are changed. Um, so I, I'm looking at a, you know, a, a fear of failure of church performance on the infant end, um, expectation of a certain outcome in terms of they're going to come back and give money to the church and where, where'd they go. And on the adult end, I'm looking, whoa, that felt good. Everybody should get to feel what I felt. So I, I'm, I've come away seeing your point about education, I think, is huge. Um, and and I, I do have to say, I see the selfishness and the uh, entitlement of the age um, showing forth in both of the ends of the discussion as you've presented them. So yeah. prayer and education and a return to a deeper spiritual life are, uh, you know, as you have said, I think as clergy, yeah. we really have to apply ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And while I was doing the interview, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I was baptized as a baby. <laughs> I've moved on in my faith journey. There's possibility, you know? So maybe that's even more what the church has to look at, like how can we keep everybody, you know, you've said you want to do this, now let's do it and, and maintain that relationship. I mean, and not only in any church, all the churches are saying, counts are down, children aren't coming, we don't have the Sunday schools, we used to have 100 and some kids, now we got 11. You know, everybody's saying that. So where is the church, I mean, this is another grad project for next year's people, you know, <laughs> where, where are we kind of lacking and falling down there? Yeah. Ruby, um, I was just wondering, with the six that you've interviewed, you, you've been talking a lot about the um, connection between the proper um, teaching from the priest, the, the pre-work that was done uh, different in all aspects um, before the person was baptized. Did that directly then correspond with their um, relationship, further in relationship with church? Was there a tie? Because we're talking about, well, if we do the right things and we do the front end loading and we do everything that we're supposed to do, then automatically they'll come to church and they'll be faithful and they'll do all these different things. Was that the experience of the six that were baptized? Um, I would have to say that that's what I saw. The, the one that no longer goes to church, the one that said I only need to go when things are bad, that kind of stuff, that person did not get the the grounding foundations that they should have had, all the others did, and I think it really made a huge difference for them. Thank you. One here and then I'll come back to you. Following up on that question, um, you talked a little bit about the godparents yeah. and the role that they had and how there was a variety of different experiences. Um, with lack of preparation for some people, was this Godparent experience also the lack of lack of that experience. Yeah, as well? I can't speak to that. I never asked that question. Like I know when I personally do baptismal prep, there is at least once, if not more, when I bring the godparents in. You're going to be making some promises, and I want you to know about them and what they mean. And so, are you really prepared to do that? And uh, for my adults, I never asked that question, so I'm sorry I can't can't speak to that. Uh, you mentioned that uh, things change from adult baptism to baptizing children as well in medieval times. So was that more or less done as a convenience? For the change from going from adults to the children? Yes, because no. the priest would be in the area, so it might be a while before they get back to that area, so they baptized everybody. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think that stemmed more out of fear fear of, like in the medieval times, and my professors can correct me on this, um, fear of 
going to hell, going to purgatory. There was a point that they even were baptizing babies in the womb. Now, I'm not quite sure how they did that, but, you well, know, so, yeah, I think it was more fear of eternal damnation. It's kind uh, of a complex historical development. The way I understand yeah. scripture, it says that we are saved by our faith, not by anything that we've done. It's our faith in what Jesus has done for us. Yeah. So how can an infant or a child unless they really understand, possibly um, be saved by their baptism. Um, I've attended uh, funerals in the Catholic Church, the uh, United and the Anglican, and every time the clergy has said, this person was baptized as an infant, therefore they believe that they are then saved. And I don't understand that because it doesn't seem to gel with scripture for me. Yeah, I think you have to hold it in front of you. <coughs> Baptism is an outward and a visible sign. So it's something that we do as humans that's showing us an inward and spiritual grace that we receive from God, bringing us into the family of Christ. And in the infant situation, the parents are standing up and saying, We're, we are going to bring this child up in the faith and educate them and teach them and that we're all going to be a part of the church as a family. And I think for my adult uh, participants, they're not seeing that happening. This is it. And, and also, we, we've also discussed the fact that uh, people don't understand what they're doing, like people who are grandparents or even the parents feel that they should, perhaps by the encouragement of the grandparents saying, you should have this infant baptized, have them done. And then they feel that that's their assurance, no matter how their life is lived after that. And I think that's why uh, you mentioned that for some people who were baptized as adults, it's a wonderful experience because they are making that decision. Mm -hmm. No one is putting that on them. It's all theirs. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they've made that commitment, and they will commit their lives to what they have said and what they've done. Mm -hmm. And I, I just jump in here, um, as for uh, traditions that do practice infant baptism as, as, as a sacrament, uh, meaning that the sac it, because it's a sacrament, it doesn't depend upon uh, one's ability to understand it or one's ability to cognitively say, I am saved, because it's, it's, if it's, that's the sacramental understanding, but, but that's a long a long That's debate hard. through history, <laughs> and um, but um, I think we are um, I have time for just one more quick question, and then we'll take a break. This is probably not a question as much as a comment, and I applaud you, Ruby, for speaking about a topic. If this is all about um, provocative, provocative paradoxes. You have really stimulated us to think about that because with baptism, especially baptism and some of the other sacraments within our church, so often um, we hold two things in our hands, the legalities of it. This is what the church expects of you if you're wanting baptism. And you come forward and you do this, 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 and this because we want so much for people to have a deep understanding of what it is that they're entering into. And we want them to be able to think about all of that. Yet on the other hand, we live, we live in a culture that doesn't do things deeply very often. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we live in a culture that really I don't know that they understand God's grace. And so how do we live that paradox of the legalistics and the these are the things that are so important and the also inviting and welcoming the stranger and finding a way to bring them in and then maybe provide opportunity um, by God's grace to for that growth to continue so your topic so well embraces that provocative paradox that we face thank daily you. thank you well said thank you Ruby